This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha from 21 degrees north and 2,550 miles west of Los Angeles. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland. Three days ago, I had the honor of attending a gathering of educators, legislators, researchers, NGOs, activists, and the media at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is located on Moku Olo'e, also known as Coconut Island. Ted Bolin was the primary instigator. And Dr. Ruth Gates, who is the primary investigator of research relating to coral reefs and climate change, was our gracious host. Dr. Gates is the director of HIMB. Also in attendance was Anthony Alto, documentary filmmaker and chairman of Sierra Club's Oahu Group. Currently, Anthony is working on a feature-length documentary film on climate change. They are both with us here today, and they are both Brits. Wow, thank you for joining me on Think Tech. I think this is my, my, the first time I've had uh, two UK uh, folks on my show at the same time. Very well, auspicious. It should have happened sooner, but maybe yeah. this time you'll learn how to pronounce aluminium correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what? Uh, al aluminium, okay. Apparently American scientists say it that way, so they must be right. <laughs> Well, thank you both for coming um, down to downtown to participate to this afternoon on Think Tech. Um, Monday, uh, Tuesday's um, meeting was really a lot of fun. Ruth, you have arguably the best um, office uh, uh, in the state, at least. You nailed it. It's fantastic to work on Coconut Island. It's an amazing facility that's owned and operated by the University of Hawaii, an organized research unit where some of the most cutting edge research in coastal marine biology happens. It's fabulous. And Anthony, you um, have one of the most fun jobs I can imagine. Yeah, I'm here under false pretenses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a politician. No, I was invited- You are media. Uh, media, yeah, well, I guess wearing the two hats. Surf, uh, uh, the Sierra Club was invited because obviously Sierra Club wants to be, is engaged in fact, on this issue. In fact, the Sierra Club of Hawaii provided the first national chair of the first National Sierra Club uh, committee that looked at the issue of Reese Day Rainey, and he's, he was at the uh, meeting. And then the current National Sierra Club Marine Team is led also by a member of the Oahu Group, the Sierra Club Oahu Group, oh. Doug Fetterly. So you had, as far as Sierra Club is concerned, heavy hitters not just at a local level but at a national level. Um, I'm, I'm there. Um, I think more because I'm making this film about climate change. Yeah. Well, let's hear a little bit about that. I don't. I don't think Ruth Before has heard the about this. Um, y yeah. All right, you're in charge. <laughs> so tell us about the film because we all know what she does. Well, so the film, funnily enough, um, a colleague of Ruth's, uh, Chip Fletcher, who is, as most uh. people all know, and most people who watch this program know, is. Mr. Sea Level Rise, I think, when it comes to Hawaii. He's the part guy who did, has done the most to put it on the map. He came up with a blue line to indicate to people where sea level, sea level rise is going to affect different parts of the state. Um, and Chip is desperate. He did a lot to help, um, help us with our campaign to get a, a, the city charter amended so we could create an Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resilience. And we met at one of those meetings, and he thought, you know, the message still isn't getting out to people just how bad climate change is. Can you make some public service announcements? And I said, um, sure, it's, you know, it's right up my alley. I went and asked the Hawaii Community Foundation. They gave me a small C grant to start the process. And then looking at it, you know, most PSAs on TV are 15 seconds. If you're lucky, you get a few 30 second ones. It's a blue moon when you get a full one minute. And so to try to explain the complexity of everything that's happening in Hawaii in PSAs it was just extremely daunting, and that's when we decided to make it, uh, uh, make it a documentary. And when you think about it, there, there is no other place in the nation, maybe in the world, that is affected on more levels, multiple levels, than Hawaii. There are places where uh, it may be that on one issue, um, there's another place where it's being affected more. There's places where sea level rise, the, the rise in temperatures is happening faster at the poles than it is closer to the equator. But you look at 
sea level rise. You look at changes in rainfall patterns which threaten our drinking water, which in, then, in turn then threaten drought, which affect the, the, the food, little food that we grow here ourselves. The fact that we're likely to be in the path of more frequent and, and stronger hurricanes. The fact that we're the extinction species, the species extinction capital of the world, more endangered species in Hawaii than anywhere else in the world. You start adding all of these things up and then you go and talk to ordinary folks and a lot of them still don't get it. That it's happening now. This is not something that's going to happen to their kids or their grandkids. It's happening now. And of course, one core piece of that is the coral reef piece. And that's why I was at this meeting, because as Ruth can explain a lot better than me, the coral reefs are the rainforests of the oceans. Right? Yes, I love that phrase. It's really beautiful. So why don't you explain uh, it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful analogy because really rainforests they are the the, the, the place where you find hundreds, millions of species that uh, occupy the spaces that are created by these complex arrays of trees that assemble in communities. And, um, you know, in the rainforest, you find medicines that treat disease. In the rainforest, they protect other land masses by breaking wind energy coming onto land. There's all kinds of things that the rainforests do. The coral reefs do exactly the same thing. The corals themselves create structures that are home to arguably 25% of all marine species in the ocean at one point or another in their life. That's an astonishing figure for a structure that occupies arguably about 1% of the ocean landscape. So they're critically important as, as homes for others. Many of that is uh, things that we find on our plates and that we eat. Some Pacific Islands get 70% of their protein from the coral reef. And that's because of the structure. OK, so right here in Hawaii, um, if we were taking the temperature of um, the health of our reefs, where would you put it? On a yeah. We're not in good shape. I mean, and actually, we are not in good shape anywhere in the world. Let's, let's be really blunt about what's happening on coral reefs. People say they're the canary in the coal mine for, for climate change. That is, ca canaries were put down when the air quality tanked, the canary died. Right, well, what's happening right now is the air quality, which is reflecting greenhouse gases and huge emissions of greenhouse gases, um, is driving warming that is pushing the environment outside of the thermal range of corals. And the downside is that we've lost already 50% of the world's coral reefs to major warming in the ocean. And um, we have that's a picture of you that. Um um, diving that yes. kind of that maybe you can you can talk about so 50% worldwide do you know mm. what it is for Hawaii or do, or, do, or have we done it's that very variable study? over space and this is a very difficult thing because we you know as scientists we can't study every place so we come up with estimates in some places the coral reef is doing quite well in other places we maybe have lost 80% of our, oh. our coral reefs in Waikiki we've probably lost everything um, because we've got such a lot of impact, not only from warming, but he, in Waikiki and in other places where you find a lot of people, those climate change impacts are being basically compounded by things that we do locally that, that are reflecting our activities on land that diminish the coral reef. And so, you know, development, um, you know, the water quality, you know, in that image you could see the water quality was very cloudy. Well. In that image, there's a white coral that's a bleached coral. That means that coral is suffering from high, higher than normal temperatures that have made it unwell. That white reflects really unhealthy corals. And you know, in the background there, you see the water quality. It's mm -hmm. cloudy. That's because there was a rain event. And there was all this suspended material in the water that was from land that was washed down during the rain event onto the reef. And with that um, rain, comes particulate matter, sediments, um, and with those sediments come pollutants that are trapped by the particles. So it's a perfect storm for the coral reef that lives next to a place where people live. So in that room w where we were gathered, there's a, a picture of us. Uh, shout out to Senator Willis Barrow mm -hmm. for taking some pictures. Um, uh, there we were, we were trying to, to, to find a language to communicate about this. And it was kind of, one of the interesting discussions that kept coming up was the one about the, the new bill with regard to the sunscreens. And um, I was watching Ruth's face. <laughs> and um, there was a lot of, there's a lot of energy around it. But then when it came down to the science side, it was like, well, 
do we want to talk about sunscreen really a lot or not? It takes a lot of energy to change legislation. Maybe we should put that energy somewhere else. But on the other hand, there are other ways to think about this. So. Who are you asking the question Well, of? Um, why don't we start out with Ruth, because yes. I just um, so, I mean, I, I think that, you know, as a scientist, we have to be very objective about the array of stressors that are affecting reefs, things that are really diminishing the reef. And there's no doubt that temperature associated with climate warming is the biggest threat. So the discussion of what comes next, is it acidification, is it sediments that are actually being suspended and burying corals, is it sunscreen chemicals, is it, you know, um, I don't know, birth control pills that have been flushed down the toilet. Or um, the really horrifying thing you mentioned, caffeine. Or caffeine. Right. Is it all, it's, it's, or just it's people hard. walking on or it. Or people walking on it. Which is next? And what's happened with the sunscreen debate is there is some science that supports the fact that the, the, the sunscreen chemicals are poisoning early and young coral polyps. And right. so they're called zombie reefs. Um, the reality is that that is probably nowhere near as big a threat as some of the other things that are, are on the reef today. But what's happened with the sunscreen debate, which is so excellent, is that people can relate to it. They understand their relationship to sunscreen and they understand that their choices are affecting the health of the coral. And so now we have traction to not only discuss sunscreen, but also discuss the other stressors that are affecting coral. So in my mind, it's all good. It's all good. Plus there's another thing that that um, you said the other day at the meeting that struck me immediately, which is that we are coral. Yeah. We are, a lot of people don't understand that coral is a living, breathing entity and organism. And you were pointing out how genetically we're very deeply connected. And you made the point that if that oxybenzone sunscreen is bad for the coral, then there's a fairly good chance that it's bad for us too. And, and so there have got, we, mm -hmm. One of, the th one of the reasons I'm making the film is that some of this scientific uh, knowledge that we're acquiring still seems a little distant from people's lives. They don't know how, you know, they, they don't understand how it's impacting them today. So even though, as Ruth, Ruth explained, oxybenzone may not be the number one stressor, it may not be our number one issue, it's an issue that the public understands, therefore it's a relatively easy political victory. And in that sense, in terms of trying to educate the public, engage the pub public, bring them in, those sorts of little victories can be important. To be able to, to have a headline saying Hawaii becomes the first state in the nation to, to, to ban um, sunscreens that may be damaging to coral reefs, I think is important. Yeah. It, it energi energizes people, gets them engaged. And so this is an area where, as we know, science has not been very good in the past nationwide in making its case, which is why we're able to have this uh, terribly anti-science administration in Washington, D.C. at the moment. And so we have to do a better, better job of trying to explain to people how the science impacts them immediately. And so um, I press gang this lady. She's going to help, help me with the film. Yay. Yes. I'm delighted to be able so to. So the, the, this is maybe a case of um, the perfect being the enemy of the good. In, in other words, if I was concerned about the legislation, well, it's only if it only says the oxybenzene, and, it, and then you change to other chem, uh, uh, to another chem, chemical that has a two-letter difference, um, but is essentially as bad, uh, but doesn't come under that legislation. Then where are we? And you know, all that logistical stuff with creating public policy. So maybe the actual public policy wording itself isn't super important, just the overall intent, because the real benefit is going to become, is going to be in the change behaviors. Yes, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do. You know, we, we, I, you know, Barbara Richmond always makes the statement that we're not managing coral reefs, we're managing people to protect coral reefs. And that is a, a really profound thing. To, to get on board with. We, it's people's behaviors that need to change. It's not coral reefs behaviors that we need to change. And so, you know, when we're talking about the sunscreen, from the policy perspective, we're better to go with a chemical class, right? Instead of talking about a specific chemical uh, you know, um, uh, compound, we should go for a class of, of chemicals and we should think strategically about what the build is in policy to get rid of all of those chemicals and sunscreens that are not good. But really, 
this point that, that I think Anthony makes, that, that they, corals are our common ancestors and we use them as models to understand human health. Um, these chemicals are really not good, and so the best thing we can do for ourselves is to put on a long sleeve shirt and a hat. Oh, and yes. And it's so and easy, and it's so cheap. It is. Ruth, we're going to take um, a one-minute break and come back and dive right back into that. Thank you. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, but others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Yeah, it's a, blu a blueprint. It is a blueprint now for how to move forward on every Welcome level. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. Today I have Anthony Alto and Ruth Gates with me and we are talking, um, we were all together on uh, the, at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at Moku Oloi, Coconut Island, this past Tuesday. And um, there we were with, there were three legislators, I don't know how many scientists, Sierra Club very well represented. So you are, um, Anthony, you are now um, uh, struggling very... I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> struggling very, very particularly with this. How do you choose what message and how to, how to put, contextualize that message as you're going through this process of making a short PSA about climate change. How, well, do, how do you do that? Don't get me, I'm, the PSAs actually, I'm hoping are gonna grow out of the film. I've been thinking okay. about them, but somehow we've gotta find, we've gotta come up with a unifying message that works across all of them, because we're gonna be talking about hurricanes and sea level rise and food and rain and all kinds of disparate things. So we've gotta find a unifying message in that. Um, the, the, the way that I wanna contextualize the piece about the reef and the coral is, there's a, a new film that came out recently called Chasing Coral which in some ways is very good, although as a, as a filmmaker, um, it was a, a lot of the film was taken up with how difficult it was to make the film, which I thought was interesting because what it was actually, what it was saying, the message it was saying is, we don't know, the public at large isn't very, doesn't feel, have an intimate relationship with reefs because it's actually very difficult to bring a, a coral reef into somebody's living room. It's difficult to film a thing. It's di difficult to film the changes it's going through. And so the film showed that in, in, in quite well, but really, the, to me, the whole heart of the film was in the last 10 minutes, where they were finally able to put up the uh, time lapses of healthy coral and then the same coral after bleaching. And this thing that is just truly astonishingly beautiful becomes ugly. And you can see people watching this footage for the first time, they're wiping tears from their eyes. Oh. Somehow or other, I want to get some of that emotion into the film. I want people to understand that we have a very visceral connection. Literally, we eat of the reef. We have a very visceral connection to the reef. I want to try and bring that home. Um, and as for the business about the legislation, um, you know, as, as Gerald Ford could or he couldn't do, you know, we can chew gum and walk at the same time, right? We could do a little bill about, about the oxybenzone and banning that and get that as a the kind of victory that will be will grab headlines because it's so simple and we can also do a comprehensive bill to um, to do something about um, these events that are bringing so much dirt into the coral off off the off the mainland off the uh, islands off the land um, that's putting so much stress on the coral and we're going to do it in language that people are familiar with it's, we can't it can't be overly scientific which is a good thing about having another Brit because you know you may have noticed Brits tend to speak Speak their minds, you know what I mean? <laughs> Speak their minds, and, and uh, I've been trying to uh, work in the aluminium, but I haven't come up with anything. <laughs> Try <it a> <laughs> 
You know, Karen, I'd just like to pick up on one thing that Anthony said, and that is that you know we can do many things simultaneously. Not only can we, we have to, because we had a warming event last year that has knocked out 20% of the world's reefs in a single year. In a single year. And the predictions are that those kinds of event will become much more frequent as we move forward as the ocean is warming. So we don't have time to, to do a, a sort of, well, we've got one small bill passed, we need to get another bill passed. Right. We have got to right. do everything in our power right now to advance all agendas simultaneously to protect reefs. It is urgent, and it really picks up on a point that Anthony made right at the beginning, that we are in it now. We're not planning for it, we're in it. And I think you told this story about um, going grocery shopping one day. This, this was a very interesting, and it really speaks to the communication of issues. I was at, in the supermarket, and somebody came up behind me who I knew and said, you know, Ruth, why are people pouring bleach on the reef? <laughs> and, you know, really, it made me sort of step back and go, wow, we've made such a mess of communicating what coral bleaching is. Coral bleaching is a stress response that tells us that the coral is imminently on its way to dying. It isn't because we poured bleach on it. But, but for, the, for me, it really was that it was a, let's throw down the gauntlet now to communicate this issue much more clearly in many more venues tuned to many different audiences. Because it's not about communicating at once. For me, it's about communicating it hundreds of times in hundreds of different ways different. to hundreds of different audiences. Yeah. Um, and obviously tuning to audience. Constantly. Well, I, I want to commend you also on the um, Gates Lab, um, the website that you have up now. Um, I think it's gateslab.com. It's uh, Gates Coral Lab. Gates Coral Lab. Dot com. Um, you are doing a lot of things that are actually sort of superhero ish. <laughs> <laughs> And so you're a great person to have on a show about climate change because it doesn't have to be all downer. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, the thing is, something like climate change, it is, it is a challenge that can be solved. We know how to solve it on the planetary scale. We know we that do. we need to reduce greenhouse gases. And we know there are many things that we can do to change our behaviors that will get us moving down that road fast. Um, and we know in our own place how to solve some of the problems that are implicit in our place. That is, the big sediments that are coming because the rainwater is being channeled into raceways of concrete that funnel everything straight onto the reef. We know that there are alternative ways of doing that. And we can discuss that and we can get together. And I think what was so great about the, the group that got together on Tuesday is people come with totally different perspectives and skills. And so what we really achieve is planning with many different skill sets that are complementary but not overlapping. And so what you were able to achieve with that planning is something so much bigger than any one set of communities like the scientists alone could do. Right, and so I was thrilled by it. I think Hawaii should be the place where corals are central. The survival of corals is central to the tourist economy. We should make them the centerpiece for extraordinary action by many different stakeholder groups. And, and I think we're poised to do that. And I'm very excited um, to see these things moving forward. So if we can get that message that what we do in our backyards what we do with the streams as far as the um, as these rain events um, cause uh, huge downpours that last for days and and then we have the the waters mm. the wastewater that go out and cover everything so that is really somehow we have to get that image together with the the coral message it's like the cleaning up our stormwater system and uh, it's just a process of what Ruth was talking about, constant engagement on every different level. I mean, it's, it's great that Hawaii is leading the world in research on how to uh, find ways to assist corals to survive these events, to allow, help encourage the ones that are best able to adapt, to adapt to higher temperatures. So there's a chance that we can find a way to help them live on. I mean, that's very high level research. It's the kind of thing that Hawaii needs to be boosting the reputation of its universities because we need the university to be a driver 
of different types of economic jobs yeah. because we're not going to be able to li rely on tourism in two generations because of sea level rise. I'm so sorry, what did you say? Would you repeat that again? On one level, you've got that high level stuff and on the bottom level, we need a campaign to tell people to stop using more pesticides in their backyards because that's the primary source of the pesticides that's ending up in our near shore waters. It's not the big farmers, it's not the GMO people, um, you know, as much as you might like to hate them, it's not them, it's us in our backyards. You can do both. You, you're ed educating at a global level, going to global conferences and getting Nobel Prizes, I hope, and what have you, <laughs> at one level. And the other level, it's just you and me doing whatever we do in the backyard. And we need to communicate on all of those different levels at the same time. And so one of the things I'm, I'm uh, most excited about with my film is that we're going to do smaller segments. We're going to edit smaller segments of the film and write lesson plans to give to schools so that they can take those, so they can do a segment on, on sea level rise, they'll have it whatever they like, five, ten minute video on it, and then a lesson plan to go along with it so that we can start getting to the next cohort of leaders, the, you know, the high schoolers of today. We want to get them when they're young and, <laughs> and get them working on this, right? So are, is, is that tailored toward Hawaii at all? You shared with yes. me the, the title. The, the it's, excellent. It's excellent. just, yeah, it's called Au Pilikia, which means trouble times, which is what we're in. Um, yeah, and it's, it's based on Hawaii. Because the other thing is, Hawaii, because we're affected by so many of these different issues simultaneously, even though most people aren't aware of that, gives us n the opportunity, and I would argue the obligation, to become a model to the world. We are a micro microcosm of the world, and we should become a model to the world of how we can respond on all of these different levels. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm so glad to see that the uh, Malama Honua folks were, were in the room, too. And I, I sort of see this as, OK, they've shown us how to be the model. And now we get to translate that from navigating a canoe to navigating a planet. Or nav navigating an island. I mean, what what Malama Honua did is it took Hawaii to the world. It, it, it sort of took us out of ourselves. Now what we need to do is a voyage inside. Oh. And I've often heard the phrase that we know more about outer space than we do, do about our own oceans. And so that, that, again, reinforces the need to be doing the kind of research that you're doing. Absolutely. Well, thank you both for, for coming downtown and, and braving Friday traffic to, um, to, have, to continue <laughs> the conversation. And Godspeed to you both. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.